Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged Show podcast coming to you today on a sunny day in the United Kingdom, like proper sunny sunshine, clear skies, clear skies, uh, delightful, delightful weather, lots and lots of solar energy going into the car. I added uh, 98 miles, not quite, I was hoping to add 100 miles, 98 miles just from solar panels. That is what I like to do, and I'm very pleased that's happened today. Doesn't happen every day, doesn't happen in the winter. Just thought I'd mention that. It's got nothing, nothing to do with today's podcast whatsoever. Today's podcast is really about us, our health, how we live in cities, how we live with with or without nature, what effect that has on our health, on our longevity, and to discuss that has been really fascinating with Dr. Melissa Lem, who is the um, uh, on the board of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. So she's very active in uh, in arguing against the fossil fuel industry and for uh, clean air, clean air in your home as well, not just on the streets, in your home. Very, very critical of gas cooking appliances. Well, they're completely safe. There's nothing wrong with gas. Yes, there's quite a lot wrong with gas, as you will discover. But it's very sort of hopeful and fascinating. And we, we, she discussed, she takes us down fascinating paths of things I've never even considered for a moment. Really interesting stuff. Um, what is even more exciting is, well, we first met Melissa at the, uh, as it was last year, the Fully Charged Live in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, and she is appearing again at uh, Everything Electric Canada, as it's now known, uh, in the beginning of September. And we're so excited to have her back because she really is a, a force of nature, but a really lovely nature. Um, so it's great thrill to, one, get this chance to talk to her. Because I didn't meet her at Vancouver last year because I, she wasn't on a panel I was chairing. Uh, so, uh, And that's one of the things that maybe people don't know about these live shows is we have really a lot of fascinating panels with incredible people, very like Melissa, uh, talking about all manner of topics to do with clean energy, electric, ground transport, you know, renewable energy, all those things. And cooking, even with not using gas. Um, so that's that's it. I'm trying to think of what else. Well, uh, later on, after we come back from Canada, we're at Farnborough uh, for a, our big show there, which is looking very exciting. And the Canadian show has gone gangbusters, I think is the term used in the, uh, in the live event business. I don't know. I'm going to shut up because Melissa is a lot more interesting to listen to than me. So please welcome to the Fully Charged Show podcast, Dr. Melissa Lem. So, Melissa, this is such a thrill for me. Thank you so much for uh, giving us your time to, to record this. It, and it, it is, uh, bizarrely, this is a topic, well, in broad terms, the topic of air quality, of, of how lungs work <laughs> and how human beings survive, has become quite a big thing. I interviewed a, an amazing doctor in London, a respiratory specialist, who drives an electric car, who came to one of our shows, who, you know, has, is quite strident in his views about air pollution. Uh, and that was the first time we'd ever done that. It was a few months ago. And then, uh, you know, it's just, it's becoming a topic that become, is clearly at, at the forefront of things. So, but before we really dive into that, do you mind explaining, you know, your background, your, you know, where you trained as a doctor, where, what you've done, how you've ended up to where you are now. Can you explain that briefly? <laughs> Happy to. Um, Robert, it's a pleasure to be on your podcast, by the way. I'm Dr. Melissa Lem. I'm a family physician based in Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, but I was born and raised in Toronto. And my first entry into the planetary health or climate change, clean energy space was actually through nature and health. I grew up really right. finding nature a respite from from everything that was going on in, in um, my neighborhood, being a kid and and bullied sometimes and that sort of thing. But as I grew older, after I had um, my child, who's now nine years old, when he was three months old, I read Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything, which is a book right. about how capitalism is driving climate change. And, and at that point, I realized, now I know I have to do something about this. So yeah. I started learning more and more about the drivers of climate change, about the health effects of climate change, and then obviously came across the information that fossil fuels are responsible for three quarters, if not more, of, of uh, 
global heating. And so um, that led me into connecting with the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, of which I am now board president, and um, Cape BC's chapter which really gets quite active around advocacy around liquefied natural gas and health about trying to electrify buildings and transportation with with clean renewable energy. And so in a nutshell, that's my journey into <laughs> planetary health advocacy. But I mean, what's so exciting about that and so kind of encouraging is that, you know, I know a lot of people who don't have a medical background who have sim- well, have similar views to you. And it's based on stuff they've read or stuff. But, you know, you, what's extraordinary is because of your professional work, you have come across this in the real world, in effect, of people who are, have been directly affected by the, the, the effects of pollutants and particulates in the air and air pollution. And, it's, and it, I think it gives it a different, it gives it a bit more leverage. <laughs> Maybe. Well, that's right. And and that's what's really powerful is the ability of health professionals, particularly physicians, who are essentially the most trusted profession globally, according to international surveys yeah. year after year. We definitely see the effects not only of the air pollution that cars release, that gas stoves release, um, but also the overall effects of, of uh, climate change that yeah. is being driven by this air pollution. So there are all kinds of reasons why it's important to, to transition to clean energy sources. Yeah. Because I mean, what's so, from a very personal standpoint, I remember that my first visit to Vancouver was in the 1980s, I think 1986 or 87. And I was visiting friends there and I just went, walked in this city and I went, this is the cleanest city I've ever been in. The air is so, oh my goodness, there's mountains, you can see, you know, it felt so, I lived in London at the time, it felt so different to London. But interestingly, when I came back to Vancouver a few times recently and walked along the, the sort of centre of around the center of the city you kind of go I can smell diesel <laughs> I've become much more sensitive to it I think but you know I then went oh it's maybe not quite as clean as I remember you know but it, it's still I mean in comparison with the medieval <laughs> mountain of confusion that is London it, it feels very clean and and well organized Vancouver but uh, well, we need to keep working on that is the thing. You know, yeah. we can't kind of rest on our laurels as um, kind of a previous city council was trying to achieve, which is the greenest city, you know, right. Vancouver being the greenest city in the world. In fact, something that just happened recently um, in this July of 2024 is Vancouver City Council gained the dubious uh, status of being the first municipal in, municipality in Canada to reverse a ban on, on gas in new buildings. So it was one of the first to enact the ban, but it just reversed right. it, which, you know, many think is due to uh, pressure from the fossil fuel lobby and also developers who want more money in their pockets and to pass along higher future energy costs to to homeowners. Yeah. And so it's um, it's something that we have to constantly be working on to make sure that the right information and and the evidence gets out there and people people act and vote in accordance with um, what's going to be consistent with better health and a livable future. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? Because it is the, you know, the the uh, sort of low hanging fruit argument that I often use, you know, that to um, electrify uh, a transcontinental flight, very, very difficult. <laughs> uh, you know, to electrify global shipping, pretty, pretty complicated and difficult, maybe it's slightly easier than flight. But to electrify ground transport, really easy. But then to electrify domestic cooking, incredibly simple. Really, exactly. really simple. You know, that and is widely not adopted. And That's widely right. adopted. Yeah, yeah. That's right. We should, like you mentioned, we should be reserving um, fossil fuels for for industries that are hard to decarbonize. But yeah. we have home heating. We have we have cooking solved. And not only do we have that solved, but in many cases, it's far superior to yeah. um, and more energy efficient than fossil fuel heating. So it makes absolutely no sense to revert back to dinosaur technology that pollutes our indoor air and drives climate change. We should definitely be uh, yeah. using clean energy in our homes. But I mean, it's something I never even thought of for a minute. I mean, we had a gas hob here at my house when we had, you know, for a year, for decades, I can't even remember. It was just normal. That's just what you had. And you and I just remember holding babies and lighting the gas and putting the kettle on in the morning. You know, I didn't even, it never occurred to me. I knew smoking was bad for you. I knew exhaust fumes are bad for you. I, you know, those sort of things I've kind of had an intrinsic understanding of. The gas cooking, I just thought, well, that's it's gas cooking. What's the problem? You know, 
It I, seems so common sense when you think yeah. about it. When you burn fossil fuels inside an enclosed space, um, often without <laughs> ventilation, yes, right? A lot of no exactly. A lot of people with gas stoves, unfortunately, particularly uh, lower income people, don't even have adequate ventilation. Yeah. It it obviously makes sense, and I think in the future, when people look back at how we heated our homes and and yeah. cooked our food, they're going to think, "Wow, that was the Stone Ages." I can't believe yeah. people burned fossil fuels indoors um, yeah. to 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 power their homes. It uh, it really is an, a much older, less inferior kind of technology. Yeah. And I mean, it is that battle as well when we have the same thing here with an enormously powerful lobby, which is the which is the gas boiler industry, the people who I'm talking in the UK really more about central heating systems. It's so common. It's, it's the vast majority of them are gas boilers that heat water that go that will go around the radiators in your house. You know, that's what I don't even know what the percentage is very, very high in the UK. And to counter that you know and to suggest that you use a heat pump is is the, the 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 venom and the attacks on heat pumps are just like oh my goodness it's a bit like electric vehicles were 10 years ago where lots of men shouted electric cars don't work <laughs> and then you know they kind of, you kind of find out they actually do work and now we've kind of, we've really passed that i'm kind of hoping that the same thing happens with home heating and home cooking I think it will. I think it definitely will. I mean, there are bylaws in place right now um, within British Columbia, the province where I live, which say that by 2030, all new heating and hot water systems across the province will be zero emissions, which essentially prevents any kind of new natural gas hookups. And of course, there are all kinds of ways the fossil fuel industry is trying to get around that by touting, yeah. you know, as you know, what's called renewable natural gas, um, yeah. which is from cow burps or whatever. But yeah. but the truth is that what the fossil fuel industry says um, in terms of how they're going to replace our fracked fossil gas supply with natural gas there's no chance that those targets will will ever be hit. Um, yeah. In 2018, they said uh, by 2030, 15% of our our gas supply here in BC would be would be renewable natural gas. Here we are, uh, six years later, and it's one percent. We have right. four years to go, and we're at one percent. So there's no way. Yeah, no. But I don't even know what renewable natural gas. I mean, they, uh, the 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 terminology is genius to call it natural. It's methane gas. That's what it is. That's not natural. I mean, it's, exactly. it's natural because it exists in the world, but it's not. You know, to call it natural makes it seem much purer than if it was coal gas. But what is what is the what, what was you, what you calling it? I can't even remember what it's renewable, called. Renewable, renewable natural gas. I know. Oh. And so, okay, first of all, I want to talk about the misnomer of natural gas. And that's yeah. really a ploy, a marketing ploy by the fossil fuel industry to make it seem better than it is. The word natural uh, immediately signifies green, clean, good for yeah. you when it's not. In British Columbia in particular, our gas is particularly uh, unnatural. Um, right. In fact, CAPE has a website that's uh, at unnaturalgas.org that talks about all the reasons why gas is not good for our health in BC. And one of them is because of the way it's extracted here is through a process called hydraulic fracturing or right. fracking, where that is you happening inject... in British Columbia, is it? It the, is the... in the is north. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And it's banned in several states. It's banned yeah. in other provinces in Canada and wow. um, it's banned in countries around the world. And the reason is, um, multiple reasons. So one of the reasons is it used millions of liters of fresh water, yes. um, many of much of which is permanently removed from the water cycle, um, to essentially be mixed with many chemicals, sand, um, multiple toxins and carcinogens, and injected below the earth to crack it open and release gas deposits. So it's not just a process which we used to do, um, which is just putting a pipe into the ground and, and methane gas coming out. It's much more energy intensive, uh, much more water intensive and polluting. And there's all kinds of research um, from across North America showing that people who live near fracking sites um, oh. have higher rates of, for example, premature mortality, um, premature births, adverse birth outcomes, lung disease, heart disease, the list goes on and on about the <laughs> so negative health impacts of fracking. It, yeah. it really is. And so I think if more people knew how unnatural natural gas was, yeah. fewer people would be willing to use it and to build new homes with it and to cook their food with it. But I mean, the, the argument, well, the, the suggestion behind the idea of renewable natural gas, is that then coming, is that like a biomass coming from biomass or what? what? What is the renewable aspect of it? Right. Well, I mean, so often the fossil fuel industry tries to conflate the term renewable gas with 
renewable natural gas. So if you if you want to call it natural gas, it has to be methane. So this right. is methane that's captured from landfills, undergoing fermentation and releasing right. uh, methane, um, and also from you know cows and livestock that uh, right. release methane from their waste. Um, but renewable gas has come to mean all kinds of other things. Um, so for example, chopping down forests and uh, Right. fermenting fermenting the wood to create methane which obviously you know doesn't sound like a good idea because it releases and generates more methane than the trees would otherwise um, yeah. when they come to the end of their life uh, it also refers to for example splitting um, so splitting gas that comes from fracking fields and um, into into hi splitting hydrogen from it in order right. to call hydrogen renewable gas right. yeah and the problem with that um, is that once you put too much hydrogen in pipes they become brittle and also hydrogen, um, in fact, burns at a higher temperature than methane and releases even more nitrogen dioxides and air pollutants into our air indoors. Wow. Um, there was right. a recent study showing that hydrogen in, in natural gas mixes actually rele uh, release more leaks into, into homes of um, chemicals, for example, including benzene, which there's no safe level of and which has been linked no. to multiple cancers. So, I mean, the more gas we have in our, in our homes, even if it's renewable, Re, you yeah. know, renewable, natural, none of it is good news for our health. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just the, the idea of renewable natural gas. It's what you breathe during your yoga class. It's just such a daft, <laughs> it's such a massive contradiction, isn't it? And, it but is. But then the, the um, I didn't, I didn't realize there was fracking going on in, so I think a lot of my uh, misconceptions about British Columbia, <laughs> you're helping diminish them because I just have it the most progressive, the most amazing, everything's spotlessly clean. And, you know, then, okay, there's tar sands up down the road a few thousand miles. But, you know, British Columbia is so clean. I had no idea. Well, the other one that I've learned recently is we have this ridiculous old coal-burning power plant in the UK. Um, it's called Drax B. It's, it, it's enormous. It's one power station that can generate enough electricity for London which is a city of around 25, 30 million people. So it's on a scale, I've been there and filmed it, it's on a scale that's hard to comprehend. But they've stopped, they've, they've become renewable <laughs> because they've stopped burning coal, which we used to import from Poland. They now uh, burn biomass, which originally came from the uh, southern United States, now comes from British Columbia. So it's put on a ship in somewhere near Vancouver, and that ship sails you know, imagine the journey that that ship is doing down to the Panama Canal across the Atlantic, you know, thousands and thousands of miles so that we burn a, a renewable. I mean, it's just, it is so offensive. But they, but the reason they can do this is because they get uh, uh, tax breaks and subsidies because they're not burning coal. And, and that's it's really become interesting. a massive scandal, thankfully. But it, you know. I mean, it it should be. And I'm assuming the biomass that they're burning are trees from British yes. Columbia. Like, what else would they be burning? Yeah. It's right? trees so, they've cut down in British right. Columbia and put on a and, truck and you know. Chip. Yeah, and I think they chip it and then they put it on a ship. Yeah, correct. I mean, we have enough fires burning, wildfires burning our yeah. trees in BC. We don't need someone in the UK <laughs> burning our trees Run them too. For you. Yeah, and no. I mean that brings me to another another point that that. Uh, the fossil fuel industry likes to make, which is that natural gas will displace more polluting energy sources in other countries. So the truth is that when you burn natural gas in a home versus coal, it's relatively cleaner than coal, but right. nothing is cleaner than energy, uh, than electric, than electric right. cooking. Um, but when it comes to climate change, there are multiple credible analyses showing that because of the methane leakage that happens during the extraction, transport, and use process, that it's a wash when it comes to climate change. That in fact, because of the super potent warming that methane causes, which is over the next 20 years, over 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide at, at heating our atmosphere, that it does nothing for climate change. So it may be better for air pollution on a very local level, but yeah. if we uh, in Canada and we in British Columbia are trying to, to work on reducing our own emissions, it's it's doing nothing for yeah. us essentially. And it's driving those those forest fires and wildfires um, and extreme heat events that are, that are sickening and unfortunately killing people in British Columbia. Because I mean, that was that last year. You had this incredible high high temperatures in Canada. Because you know, the other thing I connect with Canada is, you know, conifers and snow. Right. <laughs> not right. not unbelievable. I mean, ridiculous temperatures. I mean, it's really frightening, isn't it? Because you can sort of 
joke about it or shrug. You know, people here go, oh, I love, we've got higher temperatures. Now we can grow grapes and make our own wine. But, you know, we've had a it, couple of days here over 40 degrees centigrade for the first time in history. It's never, never happened. We've got temperature records going back to Sh William Shakespeare's time, you know, a long time. <laughs> and we right. never had a day that hot. It was unbelievable. Yeah, and that's something else about having electric heat pumps in homes is yeah. that they both heat in the wintertime, especially in temperate climates, very effectively, and cool in the summertime. And yeah. and as you mentioned, in, in 2021, we saw climate disaster after climate disaster, um, the highest temperature ever recorded in Canada, in Lytton, which then a few days later burned to the ground. Wow. Um, and then we also, during that time, we had the heat dome, which killed over um, 600 people in in BC in just one week. This was the worst mass, ca mass casualty event due to extreme weather in the history of Canada. And then, wow. you know, we had last year, we had the worst wildfire season ever yeah. recorded in Canada. Um, and And then we also had extreme flooding in 2021 that uh, that was the most expensive extreme weather event um, in Canadian history and that and wow. in terms of effects on the healthcare system um, cut off cut us off essentially from the rest of, of the uh, the country and also interrupted um, supply of vaccines and other essential right. medical services and um, and supplies to the province so there are real impacts on the healthcare system as well not just not just infrastructure costs but also our yeah. ability as physicians to deliver care yeah yeah god i mean because I mean, you've just recently had a very serious fire i mean you've had a, another town really badly affected in canada yeah so ja heartbreaking jasper, jasper. jasper. Ja yep. yeah an iconic place that so many people have visited and is so dear right. to so many people um and so you know at the same time vancouver city council was was restoring fossil fuels and natural gas to new buildings. Um, the town of Valmont, which is on the border, uh, just as people from Jasper cross into BC, they were opening their homes um, to right. thousands of terrified evacuees from Jasper. So it's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just the stark contrast, you know, between yeah. what these two towns and municipalities were doing um, really stands out. Because that's, I mean, the, when I've talked to uh, other physicians or doctors about uh, clean air and lung, you know, and, and air pollution and all that. And then it, it, the one, because this is connected to horrendous forest fires, is the sort of controlled tiny forest fire that you have in your lovely old wood burning stove, which I've got. And I've grown up with the, the delight of in on a cold winter's night, having a log fire that you sit in front of and you see it and it warms the whole house and it's amazing. And then I get the information about you know the part, even if it's you know and we have a it's a very good modern stove that seals when you close the door and it's good you know no it's still leaking <laughs> I'm, and i believe it will be and that and i connect that smell the gentle smell of of, of a, a log fire is is i find delightful you know it reminds me of my childhood and it's a sort of comforting smell as long as it's not too strong <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, the truth is burning anything in our homes yeah. isn't good for our health. Yeah, whether whether it's wood, whether it's gas, whether it's coal, um, it's just not good to breathe no. combustion byproducts. Yes, I, I now accept that and I've had, I'm, going, I'm having to adjust it. But I mean, I think, and I think that's a lot of the stuff we're seeing will be generational. I mean, I would imagine my grandchildren or great grand. Do you mean he actually burnt wood in the house? <laughs> what was wrong with him? <laughs> well, it's in the same way as that I can imagine, certainly, you know, my grandchildren potentially will ask, you know, did you really sit in a machine that had a big metal block in the front that had lots and lots of explosions constantly going off and the gas that came out of the end of it would kill you if you breathed it? And you go, well, yes, but it was sort of... <laughs> It didn't feel like that at the time. I mean, it is the most <laughs> insane thing we do is is combustion engines. It's just right. I mean, it's horrible. gotten us very far, you know, yeah, as amazing. a society. Yeah. But now that we have better and cleaner technology, it makes sense to embrace that. Um, yeah, yeah. It 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 makes no sense to go back to the past. No. But then the other thing I was really intrigued by, and I, I thought I'd read about this uh, something you'd said a few years ago, and I thought about it. I was in London, and there's two parallel streets that I often take when I'm walking from the train station to the centre of town. One is so has so many trees, you can't really see the buildings. It's a, a very old, big, old plane trees in London. And the other street, exactly parallel to it, the same length, has no trees at all and is horrible. <laughs> but 
probably a lot easier to look after and the pavements aren't, re- you know, where, where the roots are under these trees, you know, the paving slabs are all lifted up and there's, it's breaking up the roads and all that stuff. And there's loads of arguments about it, but it, they don't cut them down. You know, there are, and there are a lot of trees in London, but that was a thing you said about, the, the, you know, the, having a lot of trees on your block. So on your street, it, 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 I think it makes a huge difference. But is there kind of, were you referring to actual research about that or is it just... It, there's, Robert, there's a huge amount of scientific right. evidence that having more green space in our urban environments and even being able to just see trees out your window improves health outcomes. And in fact, right. having more green space in trees reduces our need to burn more fossil fuels and use more energy because, for example, um, urban trees and green spaces reduce the urban heat island effect um, because we don't have asphalt surfaces and hard right. um, synthetic surfaces absorbing heat as much. Um the shade also physically uh, cools the streets and cools homes so they don't have to run their air conditioning, for example, um, which sometimes can be powered, the electricity grid can be powered by fossil fuels at times. Yeah. And I mean, having trees on our streets also makes us happier and healthier. There's a lot of research yeah. behind that. And that means that we visit the healthcare system less. We see our doctors less because we have less chronic disease and less mental health. And we yeah. know that global healthcare um, if it were a country, it would be the fifth highest emitter in the world. So yeah. anything we can do to improve our health and reduce our burden reduce. on the healthcare system is going to reduce carbon pollution too, yeah. right? But that, that, is, I, that was the other thing I was going to ask you about was that, that statistic. I'd never heard that before. about So the healthcare system. So what you're talking about is hospitals, the, the production facilities that produce medical equipment and you know everything. That, that If you combine all that together, I mean, that is quite shocking. It, I know it we really should, is. We should close all hospitals <laughs> That's now. That's right. That's right. We all need to go on vacation. Exactly. All the yeah. doctors. Um, I mean, it's, so it's also so it's a number of things. So it's the right. you know the power that the the hospitals run on the actual greenhouse gases that they emit, whether it's um, gases that are used in anesthesia or actually um, pa- you know power generation at source, and it's also scope three emissions, which are all the emissions that come from the supply chain. So all the different mm-hmm. medications, um, equipment gowns, gloves, all those right. different things, particularly in family medicine. So I'm a family doctor. Um, that is responsible for the bulk of our emissions within primary care is right. uh, our, all those supply chain things. I mean, in our in our offices, um, we're pretty low tech. We don't have all you know special equipment and patients hooked up to uh, to different machines, but we do use a lot of um, a lot of like syringes and gloves right. and prescribe a lot of medications, for example, yeah. that are responsible for a lot of our emissions. It is. It, I mean, it is a, uh, how how you work around that. I mean, obviously, you could have a solar powered hospital, or you could use renewable energy for, in a lot of those things. But I mean, having for the first time uh, in my life, I'm very lucky. A few years ago, just before uh, the, the the COVID outbreak, I was in hospital for four days, and the first time I'd ever spent a night in a hospital. And I was. I am looking back now. I was fairly unwell at the time, so it wasn't really it wasn't at the forefront of my mind. But I'm extraordinarily grateful. To fossil fuels at that time that kept that hospital warm and lit and clean and you know allowed the treatment that I had you know so you kind of it's a kind of a, a an interesting you know I could sort of think about oh I should ride a bicycle or I should walk or I should drive an electric car but when you're in a hospital you want to be looked after you know you don't care what else is happening in, in that sense right well I mean you know what's great about the NHS in particular is that they are leaders in the world in terms of decarbonizing their healthcare system oh, and they've done it through wow. they are they're way ahead of most of us they're way ahead of us here in Canada wow. um, and it's through I mean for example they're working on electrifying their ambulance fleet yes. um, they're pursuing different waste reduction uh, policies and also um, reducing prescriptions of greenhouse gas intensive medications. So, you know, we don't, our hospitals don't need to be powered long-term by fossil fuels. We don't need to emit that much. I mean, there is definitely a move afoot um, that in fact, this move is is spearheaded by the WHO as well to decarbonize our healthcare system because as physicians, we take the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm. We also yeah. want to be doing no harm in the delivery of, of health care. Yeah. Because I mean, that I'm, we might be getting off topic a bit, but I'm just fascinated by it. So are there some, uh, is some drug manufacturing more energy intensive than others? I don't, I mean, you know, or, the, or do some of the material, the, the ingredients in a specific drug have an impact because of where they source from or 
Is that part of the, 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 the bigger picture? Right. Well, um, in terms of the kind of medication or the kind of delivery system with the biggest greenhouse gas impact, it's definitely uh, meter dosed inhalers. So people with asthma or chronic oh, obstructive right. pulmonary disease, those kind yeah. of the wet spray, um, yeah. there are very powerful greenhouse gases in that propellant. Um, wow. But there are great alternatives that are just as effective, dry powder inhalers, where you essentially use your own lung power to to uh, to inhale yeah, the yeah, dry yeah. powder out of the inhaler. And um, it was a colleague of mine uh, did research recently in the Fraser Health Authority, which is a health authority here um, in the lower mainland of BC, that showed that inhalers were responsible for about one third of greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions in that health authority. So if wholesale, you could switch all those people very easily from um, spray inhalers to dry powder inhalers, you would be eliminating a huge amount of, of greenhouse gas emissions. And then yeah. of course, you know, there are medications that, that, uh, for example, deliver medication using plastic re- uh, patches that are single use. Um, right. there are also medications that you, uh, are delivered in applicators again, like a plastic applicator that you use, uh, once and throw out. So there are lots of different ways that we can, we can reduce waste and reduce right. greenhouse gases through, through smarter medication manufacturing, uh, right. and use. Well, that is, that's, this is a topic that I am very confident has never been discussed on the Fully Charged Show in 14 years. <laughs> it's always a first time. <laughs> it's always a first time. It's really, it is really uh, very extraordinary. Um, uh, we've, I'm just trying to go, I'm looking down my list of things. Uh, oh, yeah, we've covered a lot of it. It's really good. The, t- oh, the nature pill. I love that notion because, I mean, I've, I then realized oh, I'm extremely lucky. I lived in London for, I think, 15 years uh, as a younger person, and it was wonderful. But I was born and raised in a small village. So my natural home is in a kind of rural environment, which is where we've lived for the last 35 years. And we're very lucky. And I then realized, oh, God, I do take a nature pill <laughs> quite often. But it's so easy. And then you realize the in, in, inequity in that. It's so easy. I walk literally out of my door, front door and I'm, I'm taking a nature pill because I'm surrounded by forests and fields and meadows, you know, not, not city streets. Uh, but that, so the research around that area, and that totally made sense to me, that, that if you can find a way to get out, and I mean, particularly, you're very blessed in Vancouver because I have been on bike rides out of Vancouver and you go, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, you feel, I felt like after an hour's bike ride, I felt like I was probably nearly in Alaska. And that on the map, I'd moved about half a centimetre. <laughs> but it was so wild and so amazing forests and everything, so close to the city. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, thanks for bringing it up and bringing us back to this topic. So this is actually my favorite topic to talk about, which is nature and health. And I know this is about electrification. So, you know, I'll try not to take too much time talking about it. Um, But here in Canada, we have a national nature prescription program called PARX. Uh, That's an initiative of the BC Parks Foundation. So this is um, the official partner, charitable partner to BC Parks where doctors and nurses and any other regulated health professional professional in any province in Canada can literally prescribe nature time to their patients to improve their wow. health. And, wow. you know, there's tons of evidence behind that from improving blood pressure to cholesterol to diabetes, mental health issues like anxiety, depression, prenatal outcomes, cancer care. The list goes wow. on and on about the health benefits of, of nature. Um, and, it's uh, I, I love the story that you told about being able to walk right out your front door and head yeah. into nature, but it's true that not everyone has access to those kinds of beautiful green spaces. Yeah. Um, I think it's important if you don't, especially for those of us who live in, in cities, maybe downtown where there isn't as much nature access, is to find nature where you can. Um, is yeah. also to bring it indoors because, for example, um, patients in hospitals sometimes, because they're too ill or hooked up to equipment, can't can't go outside to see nature. Yeah. So bringing in um, indoor plants, putting photos of nature on your walls, listening to nature sounds, even right. the smells of nature has been shown in research to improve different health outcomes. Wow. Wow. That, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it, it, there's a, an element of common sense there that you just think, yes, of course, I understand that. You know, it does make sense that that, that would be the case. And I, you know, but I, and I think it's also interesting. I, it, I get the feeling that our forefathers and mothers had a clue on that when you think of you know i mean london as an example hyde park is an enormous green space central park in new york i mean it's been a thing for many hundreds of years 
to to have that kind of space somewhere nearby. I mean, there's, there's hundreds of parks in London all over the place. And those early, we have to be thankful to those early yeah. city planners for, for making sure that was prioritized. And I love it when our intuitive sense that something is good for us matches up with the evidence. Really? When you right. st step outside into nature, you feel calmer, you, um, you can focus better. Uh, but the science also backs, also backs that up. So that's great. Yeah. I mean, not every city, though, in the world has no. been planned that well. Um, so no. Toronto, where I, you know, where I was born and grew up, they built a huge freeway and industry right along the waterfront. Whereas here in Vancouver, right. I know they prioritized keeping the seawall intact and allowing people access to nature. So, yeah. I mean, thankfully, there are moves to reverse a lot of that industrialization as cities are realizing how important nature contact is um, yeah. for the population. But there's still work to be done for sure. Yeah. And it is that, I mean, you know, not, I'm not trying to go back onto that topic, but the the impact the car has, forget what powers it, forget about pollution, the actual impact on our lives that the car has had in, in the last hundred years is phenomenal. When you think of those decisions that were made perfectly legitimately, they weren't made by evil people. They went, we want to get a lot of people through this, this area. Let's build a massive highway right next to the water. <laughs> It is, you know, now you can look, we can look back on that now and go, that is insane. I mean, that's the same way as there are some big, like, freeways that come right into the middle of London. They knock down thousands of houses. We're talking back in the 60s, 70s, you know, to make way for a huge road. That Once you get off it, you, you're in medieval streets in London. You can't move. <laughs> and the traffic is, the traffic in the centre of London is the same speed as, as horse-drawn traffic was 200 years ago. There's no difference. It's wow. about seven or eight miles an hour. So that's what right. a horse can pull a cart with. You know. Yeah. And then when you think about the opportunity cost of having all that fossil fuel vehicle infrastructure, yeah. it's huge. I mean, here in the city of Vancouver, we have one third of our public spaces is taken up by parking lots and roads. One yeah. third. And if you think about how I know how many green spaces could yeah. be put there instead that would improve our health instead of harming it, it's it's pretty incredible. It is, it is difficult, isn't it? Because I think it is the, the hardest argument that has sort of emerged for me in the last, say, five years. I was on a panel just recently at a big festival in the UK where there was four of us. It was a pointless panel because there were four of us who, and the idea of the organisers was there'd be an argument and a discussion about, no, we all 100% agreed with each other. You know, <laughs> cities and cars, bad idea. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You know, and, and uh, you know, public transport, more physical fitness. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I, I know you all, you all agree with that. But what is interesting is that that whole consensus now is, is kind of anti-car. You know, there's a lot of movements of that, you know. And in a way, I mean, it's really difficult because it is then you're curtailing people's freedom to drive their <laughs> two-ton pickup truck. Well, I like to think of it as less anti-car and more pro-health, more yes. pro-livable yeah. future, right? More, more clean cities. Um, I yeah. mean, we, you do have to say there are people, for example, with mobility issues sure. and certain work requirements who require private vehicles. But that I would say that's not the majority of us. If we had oh, no. better, more reliable public transit, um, fewer and fewer, fewer and fewer people would use cars. So yeah. I agree. I mean, we need massive investments in in public transportation so that yeah. it becomes a, an attractive uh, option. Yeah. Now, I mean, that is a massive hill to climb, and uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know that that's the, quite what we're talking about. But the the overall, uh, in an overall, in a big picture view, do you think that the the um, the air that we're breathing generally is improving or getting worse. I mean, if, for instance, in, in Vancouver, you know, is, are more people adopting, like, not, not using gas to cook with, not, I mean, I know there's quite a lot of electric cars there, but is that, would you say that, if you bring that up with your patients or clients or however you describe them, what is their reaction? Are they immediately going, I love my gas cooker, I'm never going to change? <laughs> or, From a pure fossil fuel use perspective, uh, we we do have cleaner air um, because right. of increased adoption of electric vehicles and more transition to electric cooking. And as people become more aware of the health harms of gas stoves, they're transitioning on their own. Um, I want to tell you a story, in fact, about colleagues of mine, a, a cancer doctor, oncologist, and a nephrologist. And um, 
ever since I, so I told them about the health impacts of gas stoves and I thought, okay, whatever, uh, you know, climate change, it doesn't, so gas stoves, even though they have an outsized effect on indoor air pollution, they don't actually contribute as much as heating to climate change. But then once um, I sent them articles around the research behind benzene and how gas mm-hmm. stoves leak leak a known carcinogen, benzene, um, even when stoves are off, that was my, what made them pay attention. Yes. And so yeah. they, in fact, shortly after um, I sent them some studies around that, ripped the gas stoves out of their homes wow. and replaced them with induction. And they're now telling their patients, particularly cancer patients, who will do anything wow. they can. Um, to to heal and to prevent cancer recurrence, they're telling their cancer patients about this. And some of their patients are also removing their stoves from their homes because they don't want to be exposed to these pollutants at all. Um, So as a combination, uh, from a combination of more public awareness and also legislation to end gas hookups to new homes and to promote more electric vehicles, we are seeing cleaner air from a fossil fuel perspective. But unfortunately, the effects of climate change, um, because of all the fossil fuels we've burned to date, are coming home to roost. So yeah. while we're cleaning up our, our uh, fossil fuel carbon pollution, we've got wildfires, which yeah. um, summer after summer is causing smoke season and sometimes even extending into the spring and fall. We're having um, terrible incidents of poor air quality because of wildfire smoke. And yeah. so the evidence around that is starting to emerge. And uh, so anyway, I'm not saying all is lost. I'm no. saying, you know, in in general, we are moving towards towards cleaner urban air, particularly yeah. around times when there isn't smoke in the air. Um, yeah. But unfortunately, you know, some of those effects have 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 come home to roost and, and we are experiencing yeah. worse air quality as effective climate change driven by fossil fuels. But I mean, that the very fact that there is now a term to describe it, a smoke season is just so depressing, isn't it? I mean, that, that that's a you know, oh well, we'll see you, we'll see you after smoke season because we don't want to sit out in the outside. That's horrifying. It's really frightening. It is. I mean, because I haven't seen. I, I'm sure it has happened, but I haven't experienced it. Are there times when there are forest fires fairly near to Vancouver, and then you get the smoke in the city? Because you know, I know that happened in New York big time a few a few a couple of years ago. Right. Well, they don't even have to be that close is the thing right. um, because air currents carry yeah. air, carry, carry the smoke everywhere. I mean, a, a few years ago, we had smoke blowing up from California um, right. and Washington that right. caused extreme air pollution in Vancouver. And then, I mean, it yeah. could blow in from the interior of BC. And then, as you mentioned, our wildfires in Canada blew all the way to New York um, yeah. and Toronto, which is, you know, nowhere near forests that could, that could right. burn, um, causing record amounts of air pollution. So what we do here in British Columbia doesn't just stay in British Columbia. No. What happens to no. our forests and our, our air quality doesn't stay here, um, no. which is why, uh, anyway, which is why it, it doesn't make sense to, to talk about how what we do uh, on a smaller scale doesn't have an impact. It really does. Um, yeah. Legislation air pollution it echoes beyond the borders of of our province and our country but i mean you definitely it you know it really i really get the impression from talking to you that you're at the kind of you're at the front line of this that you're you know very aware of it and i mean you you have to be i'm presuming you have to be sort of diplomatic with your clients or patients you know you can't sort of go you can't sort of harangue them and say but you kind of but you can't I'm assuming it's becoming more and more common that you, you you're going to be saying to them there are certain things you can do to help help yourselves and improve your lives. Right. But I mean, again, there's that you know the fact that, that the doctors you knew had the financial resources to rip out their gas cookers and put in, you know, and they will have owned their homes. If you're renting a home or you what, however, and you've got a gas cooker, what are you going to do? You know, it's not it's right. much harder. Well, even if you don't own your own home and you're renting, there are cleaner cooking technologies you can use in your home. Right. You can, they're very inexpensive induction hot plates that you can buy. That's true. Um, yes, there are. You know, maybe 50 to a hundred dollars that you can buy yeah. that and microwaves. I mean, there are yeah. different, you know, cooking methods that don't emit uh, air pollutants into your home. Um, yeah. while we, while you're waiting for the end of life of your, of your gas appliance, um, so it's not it's it's not just wealthy people who can make these changes that will improve their yeah. health. Um, you can also cook electric even if you have a gas stove in your home, yeah. and we do that. I mean, so 
we recently uh, bought a new home that's all electric. That was really important to me that the home right. be all electric. The current place where we live has a gas stove and we use yeah. it as little as possible. Right. We use our slow cooker. We use our microwave. Um, we run our range hoods on, on full, uh, our, rain hood, our range hood on full when we're cooking. Open the windows. Right. Um, my son, who's nine, year old, nine years old, if he smells gas... <laughs> He makes a big stink about that, no pun right. intended, um, because he knows it's bad for his health. So right. um, there are ways that we can we can reduce our risks, even if we do have to still cook with gas. That's really good. Well, if, well, we can all well, I can say to anyone who lives in Vancouver, please come along to the live show and, and see Melissa in in person, because uh, you know you were an absolute star last year. You've really made a you had made a big impression on the team. That's because I would probably have been doing another panel somewhere else, so I didn't see what happened with you, but that's. Thank you very much for doing this today. And I look forward to seeing you in Vancouver. Thanks. Likewise, Robert. I mean, the show was incredible last year. I brought my whole family there. They loved the huge electric trucks and electric vehicles yes. and electric cooking and all the dialogue that was happening. Um, so I encourage you all to come out too. Very good. Thanks very much. Well, I really hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I really, it was just absolutely mind-boggling sometimes, some of the things we talked about there. The nature pill. I think I'm going to go out now and have a nature pill. Anyway, that's all. Uh, please tell your friends about this uh, podcast and the Everything Electric show and the Fully Charged show. And please, if you can, if you're anywhere near it, uh, can come along to one of our live events, please do. They're great fun. We love to see people there. Uh, they are amazing events. Uh, very. We've heard, we've had a lot of feedback about them recently. We've done over 100,000 test drives in electric cars. I think that's something to crow about a little bit. Anyway, that's all. As always, if you have been, thank you for watching and listening.